All right, so yesterday we were talking about the Continental Fuel Injection System, and we went through an overview of how it worked, and now we are just writing some notes and revisiting all the stuff that we talked about. And currently we are talking about the fuel injection pump system, this thing over here. Uh, we said that fuel enters the swirl chamber, and then it goes up to the swirls out the vapors and the vapors go out the vapor ejector um, fuel enters the pump fuels then either sent to the fuel control unit to the relief valve or the vapor ejector and that brings us up to 0. 0.5 What do we have for five here? Amount of fuel going to the fuel control unit is dependent upon the size of the return path to the inlet side of the pump in a way that we have not really seen before. So the amount of fuel that's going to the fuel control unit is completely dependent upon how much doesn't get returned, right? So again, if I make, you can see that up there when I do that. If I can make this orifice bigger, do I get more or less fuel to the engine? Less. Less, because more wants to bypass, so excellent. <clears throat> All right. So the amount. Of fuel going to the FCU. Is dependent. on the size of the return path. On the size of the return path. And the size of the return path is determined by what? Two things. <coughs> what two things? One, okay, the, the um, high end orifice and the low end. low end relief valve on the return path. Where are we here? Uh, that's good right there. Dependent on the size of the return path. Oh, I can back to the inlet side of the pump. Hang on. Did you, did you just say two things? Technically three, because if you slow down the speed of the pump, that would change it too, right? Well, then technically we can start adding a whole bunch of things, like <laughs> okay. wear of the pump, and, uh, <laughs> size of the ejector going back. <laughs> so it's the two main things. How's that? Okay. Okay, at idle. <laughs> at idle, the main metering orifice is, at idle, the main metering Orifice is to fill in the blank to meter fuel. Too large. At idle, the main metering orifice is too large. too large. Very good. It's too large to meter fuel. So what do we use? So a relief valve. determines the amount of fuel that goes to the fuel control unit. Now, oops, it does not, fuel control unit. The fuel control unit then decides or dictates how much fuel goes to the Manifold valve, which then distributes <coughs> off to the engine. So we still have one more thing to go here. All right, this is also known as this that adjustment. This is known as the low pressure. Or idle. adjustment so 
So at high power settings, the relief valve is open too wide to do any metering, so we must depend upon the main metering jet, main metering, well, jet or orifice. You got it. So seven at higher power settings. The relief valve is open wider than the main metering orifice. So the main metering orifice does all the metering, it does the metering. This is known as the, as the what? Care to guess? Hypertrip? Yep. And we call it the high end adjustment. All right, since the pump is a positive displacement or constant displacement pump, the faster the engine goes, the more fuel has to go through there, right? All right, since the pump <coughs> is a constant displacement, pump, engine speed affects the amount pump amount affects the amount of fuel pumped so high rpm equals more fuel. More fuel out of the pump to what? What comes next? Nope, before the engine? Fuel control unit, there we go. All right, nine, the pump, the pump has two adjustments. What are those adjustments? All right, low pressure relief valve. And that is for high or low RPM? Low, okay. low RPM. Low RPM. And what's the other one? Okay. High end adjustable orifice. The very old Continental pumps did not have a high-end adjustable orifice. They had a high-end fixed orifice. So in order to change that, you actually had to take the pump apart and get in there and, and uh, replace the orifice. Now, thankfully, I did not have to work on those. I always worked on the newer style. I don't, they must be really old, those. Uh, the only place I've ever seen one is across the street in the lab. <laughs> All right, so let's see, pump. Pump provides more fuel than the engine can handle, so return is necessary. I don't know if that's necessary to say, but pump provides more fuel than engine uses, so a return is necessary.
Hand getting sore there? Yeah. How about mine? I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, let's see, I'm going to condense here, so that's going to throw everything off our integral. We have an integral check valve. Allows boost pump to bypass the engine driven pump. And why, why do I want to do that? Why do I need a check valve to allow the boost pump to bypass the engine driven pump? So what are, what are some couple reasons? For starting. Okay, for starting. <coughs> because there is no primer system, usually. Sometimes there are, like uh, the Skymasters that we have. They actually have, a, and I love them for this, they have an old school plunger uh, primer system that makes starting those engines a lot easier because they're, uh, IO 360s, what's the I stand for? Injected, Injected which is what we're talking about. Uh, so that makes it a little bit easier, but this is the only uh, fuel injected engines I've ever seen with a primer system on them. Most of the time you just use the nozzles that are built in. Uh, what else would I need this bypass for? In case, my pump breaks. In case the engine driven pump fails. Correct. Now this is kind of a unique design and the whole design of this system was based upon the fact of the pump. So we get rid of the constant displacement pump that is highly calibrated to how much fuel is going towards the fuel control unit and how much is going back around and that breaks and fails and now we just have a boost pump that is not really set and throwing fuel in there, is that going to work real well? Not so much. So my sources tell me, number one, they're very reliable. <laughs> two, we'll say due to design, engine will only operate at about 75% power with boost pump. So consider that if that's true and you're a wide open throttle and this pump fails, what's the engine going to do? Probably going to die. Well, assuming you don't have a boost pump running, what's the engine going to do? Die. Die. So you do the smart thing, you reach over and hit the boost pump. It's going to run really lean. Going to run really lean. Why is it going to run really lean? It's because you're only getting 75% of the fuel that you need a full throttle. There you go, you're getting 75% of the fuel for full throttle. So uh, it probably won't run well. So as you pull the throttle back, it's going to start running better. Until you get to a point, then it's going to start running yes. richer. So you're going to find that sweet spot right there, 75%. As long, I guess as long as you're not trying to climb, you're going to be okay. Well, well technically, at lower, you could lean in, right? You could. So then, below 75%, you will, if you lean it properly, you uh -huh. actually are just fine with the boot pump. But beyond that... I don't know if I'd say just fine, because you're probably going to be sitting in a mess. Okay. And it's going to stink in there. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have to fly with both hands like this on the, on the throttle, little lean, throttle, lean, throttle, lean. Oops, get the prop in there. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the fuel control unit. Fuel air control unit. There we go. I'm like, what? The same thing. Okay. Fuel air control unit. One. So fuel air control unit is this right here. That's the fuel air control unit that I'm talking about. More and more like this right there. Not counting this. 
There we go. So, casting and bore size. Our match to the engine. So when I say match to the uh, match to the engine, I'm talking about the, the <coughs> cubic displacement of the engine. So all 520s are going to need a certain bore size. 470s a little bit smaller. The 360s a little bit smaller. Uh, going back here, which one of these contained the Venturi? No. None of them. None of them. Oh man, you guys are paying attention. With some of you are. All right, so match to the engine size. There is no Venturi or impact tubes. So what measures out the air? Uh, wish and a prayer. A <laughs> wish and a prayer. Uh, a wish and a prayer, and I don't care because <laughs> it doesn't care. So auto play doesn't measure it, but it's there. So just a throttle plate. Idle screw and linkage to the FCU. So how, speaking of idle screw, so how do I set the idle on this thing? Like you would any other engine. Thank you. Like I would any other engine. Just got a screw. Screw it in and the idle goes up. <coughs> screw it out and the idle goes down. All right. Now we'll talk about the fuel control unit. So it's almost, oh, it's always attached, unless uh, all the ones I've seen, attached to the air unit and connected by direct linkage. So if you remember, Find a decent picture. There we go. There's a good picture right there. So if we look at this, here is the uh, air control unit. Here's the fuel control unit. Fuel control unit is mounted by a bolt to the air unit. This shaft right here controls what directly? That's just the throttle plate. So this screw right here is the throttle speed. idle speed. So screw it in, idle speed goes up. Screw it out, idle speed goes down. How much should the idle speed be? Oh, 550 to 750. Okay, 550, 650, somewhere around there. Okay. And then direct linkage over to the fuel control unit. This arm right here, the direct linkage has idle mixture. So idle speed, idle mix. Idle <laughs> mix, idle speed. So attached directly that way, let me see. One side is connected to the throttle. Of the fuel control unit. One side of the fuel control unit is connected to the throttle. What is the other side of the fuel control unit? There you go. Other side is connected to the mixture. All right, what's inside? Center contains a fixed metering plug. I'll go with that one. All right, so 
The center contains a fixed metering plug. So uh, coming through here, we go through here. Uh, right here is a fixed metering plug. So it's just a plug with the metering orifice in there. So that's your main metering orifice right there. Center has a see, fixed metering plug. Trying to decide if we want to write all of this out here. I think we'll abbreviate a little bit. Fuel enters inlet and passes through filter to mixture control. To the mixture control manual. So right here, mixture on this side, fuel comes through, through our little screen. Now it's gonna go through the manual mixture control. So manual mixture control, one chamber returns, uh, one chamber connects with fuel return. And one chamber. Connects. To the metering valve. I did not want to write that. <laughs> Hang on. Error. Really? <laughs> Can you do this? <laughs> Just put a line through it. My pen doesn't do that. <laughs> so you say my pen's better than your pen? Yeah. Fuel enters inlet and passes through the screen to the mixture control. Yes, I do want to say that. Uh, what I want to say is one, in the lean position, in lean position, um, more fuel is directed. back to the fuel control unit. I like that. And in rich position, more fuel, less fuel is directed back to the fuel control unit. I can say that, or more fuel is directed to the a metering valve. So what I'm saying here is as fuel comes through the screen and now this mixture control right here is going to move orifices over here and what it's going to do is determine how much is and so in rich um, I'm going to send more fuel off to the manifold or off to the engine, or that's where it's headed, and a little bit or none back to the pump. As I go lean, the pump has determined how much fuel has to go, right? So the pump's saying, hey, engine, at this RPM, you need this much fuel. You got to have it. So it's very one-track minded pump. Engine, you got to have it. So it's sending it off to the engine. Constant displacement, right? It's got to go somewhere. There's no just kind of orbiting around. So it sends it off to this fuel control unit. Fuel control unit's designed to handle that much fuel. But the pilot's saying, hey, wait a minute. I don't want that much fuel. I want to lean it back a little bit, either at economy or up at altitude. So you got to have some way to control that. So all of the 100% of the fuel comes in that the engine's supposed to need. And the pilot says, no, wait a minute. I only want some of that fuel. I want to send some back. So some of it is going to come back. So depending on how you've rotated this right here, is going to line up some ports over here, which is going to determine how much <laughs> then gets to the engine, 
<coughs> versus how much goes out and back to the inlet side of the pump to be recirculated and come back and try again. You can leave that open, Dennis. <laughs> so at the same time that, that you're allowed to figure out this mixture, the throttle is also doing some, some final metering right here before it gets off to the distributor valve, or manifold valve, sorry. So it can do, does the final metering through the metering orifice, and then in here is another little orifice that's gonna send it off and out. Uh, I'll tell you there's also, there's some really cool little thi other things in here that none of the drawings depict, but you're gonna get a chance to kind of figure this out in lab. And there's a, a pretty good write up and when you get this apart, you're gonna find there's little check valves and other, other passages in here that, and I'll just give you a hint or tell you, that what's happening is when you go to idle cutoff, you want a nice clean shutoff of fuel. Um, and at idle, you can bring it back and it's actually gonna line up some passages to allow fuel to come back out in their little check valves, very, very tiny little check valves that'll drain fuel back off, out and around that allow a nice clean fast shut off of the engine and give it somewhere to go. So you can look for those little check valves. They're inside this, the main metering, the fuel metering plug. All right. Um, metering valve. is linked to the throttle. The metering valve has, has a cam-shaped opening. which means it just gets progressively larger. <laughs> what else have we looked at that has progressively larger holes, so to speak? Manual mixture on the Stromberg. Yep, that works. I was also thinking of the manual mixture on the Marvel Shoveler too. So either which way, they're not Cam-shaped, but same theory. As throttle is opened, metering valve allows more fuel to be sent to the manifold valve. And of course, as the throttle is closed, less is sent. And that brings me to the fuel manifold valve. Has two functions. What are those two functions? Open and close. Open and close is the functions. Oh, come on, we can do better than open and close. Allow fuel in. Let's think about what were the functions for the RSA system. Come on. Who's asleep? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. We'll know this as soon as the Prince wakes up. <laughs> Distributes. Fuel evenly. There we go. Wow, you got it. Good job. Fuel Thank you. evenly. Oh, to all cylinders. Well, because I called it a fuel manifold valve. What should we call it? Or that's what we should call it on the Continental. Also known as the distributor. Flow divider. Flow divider. Flow divider. As it was throwing me off. 
I know, it does me too. All right, uh, and so distributes fuel evenly to all cylinders, and what else? Provides something. There you go. Provides a positive shutoff. Uh, let's see, I pulled up a new picture here. <coughs> Not this one. So what happens is fuel enters, fuel enters here, fuel enters here, is it's going to push up on this diaphragm. And this diaphragm has a spring there, and this upper area is open to atmospheric pressure with a little vent right here. So you have a vent, atmospheric pressure, Fuel comes in, pushes up on the spring, and it pushes down on this, I'm sorry, as the, comes in, pushes up on the diaphragm. The diaphragm is going to lift up a main plunger. <coughs> so it'll lift up a main plunger, which then allows fuel to go in, but fuel cannot flow yet because it has to go through the main plunger, through the openings, which are hard to pick up on this, and then push down on this little tiny plunger that's inside of the main plunger that you won't be able to see when you're actually looking at an actual one because it's inside and it's really tiny and you have to wonder how they even built those things and then it pushes that down so it kind of like cocks it or loads it and uh, lifts it up and prepares for the fuel and then 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 through and depending on which book you read the one i prefer talks about the reason why they have this double poppet system is they want the diaphragm to go all the way up and locked it doesn't really lock but all the way up as far as it can go before fuel starts to go, because if it's halfway up, what happens? It doesn't get its full potential. Well, what's happening on the RSA as it goes half up, partially up? Limits the V-slot. Okay, it has the V-slot, which does what? Meters. It meters, mm -hmm. all right. And so it appears they don't want this to meter. They want this, the uh, diaphragm to go all the way up with the main, main in pop it to go all the way up then push on the lower poppet, then start flowing fuel. So it looks to me like it's a lot going on there to make sure that it doesn't regulate fuel. So you won't be able to see all this right here because that's all internal to the main poppet. So let's go to the next page. Ah, well, I'm on this page. As I mentioned, there's a little <coughs> vent right here. And that vent goes to atmospheric pressure. And the idea is that you don't want to trap air in here because if you did trap air in there, then it takes more fuel pressure to open that up and things don't go well. So speaking of that, uh, there is a note, a service bulletin or something, you never ever face this towards the front of the engine. Why not? Um, it would have a hard time pushing air out. Yes, impact air from flight and the propeller, where they'd go in there and then push it back down. <coughs> so I, I've never encountered that, but I could just imagine somebody taking one of these apart because there's a screen in here. You can see right there. So you can take this apart at an annual, take out the screen, check the screen. I could just see somebody putting this back on so it faced forward. Otherwise, it faces off to the side and it looks kind of silly or maybe to the back. So, ah, we should point it out in the front. And then the pilot's saying, man, every time I get up, you know, really get going, the filter shuts off. <laughs> but it's okay because the airplane starts slowing down and then it, you know, starts working again so you just placard it do not fly over x number of miles per hour all right so uh i know it's, i just did this today i just snapped a picture so fuel inlet so here's the diaphragm it's going to come under here now at least you can make out this poppet a little bit the main main one a little bit better and fuel is going to come through here so it's going to come stop right here as this goes up this right here will align with that so that it comes in this way. There's the little hole. Fuel goes in that hole, pushes down on this, and then that allows fuel to come out. There's the seat right here. So it comes through here, opens the seat, comes around, out, and then off to the different nozzles. All right, fuel manifold has uh, that. Uses a spring-loaded diaphragm that lifts valve off seat. Uses a spring-loaded diaphragm. That lifts valve 
off its seat. <coughs> And there is a little poppet. Valve inside, I'll say the main poppet. That keeps fuel from flowing. Until the proper pressure. Proper pressure is reached. And this keeps The distributor from regulating fuel. Vent on top must <coughs> be kept away from ram air. So it's usually facing off to the side or backwards. <coughs> All right, now we can talk about nozzles. Pictures of nozzles here. Well, I guess that's everyone I got. There we go. There's our nozzles. Guess what? They're pretty much the same no, thing. No. All right. Can't move it yet. <laughs> Continental nozzles are basically the same as Bendix. Although they're a little different. They do have numbers stamped on them, but the numbers mean something different. And I'm not aware of any requirement to put the A in any particular uh, orientation, but at the same time as I think about continentals, I think all of them are vertical. I don't think I can think of any horizontally placed ones. So uh, they're stamped. They also uh, have an A. A is the baseline flow. B is a little bit more flow, and um, C is even more flow. So that's just how they go. Can I move this? Yep. Yes. When you say they're numbered, do you mean? <laughs> Letter. <laughs> They're numbered like A, B, C, and D. Oh, not like one, two, three, four. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Is that different than the, uh, than the A stamped on the wrench flat? A little bit, which is what I just said. Nozzles, basically the same. <laughs> basically the same as the Bendix system. Same rules apply. Uh, hoppies don't shove things in there. They have a little screen. Um, they're air bleed type nozzles. There are letters stamped on the wrench flats. That indicate flow rate. So A is baseline, B is one half gallon more per hour than A, and C is one gallon more per hour than A.
All right, I have a whole like page and a half that I'm going to cut out because honestly, it's a little much. All right, sounds good. So, but I tell you, it has to do with this. And so I told you that's a porta test, and the porta test has pressure gauges and flow gauges, and these are things that are pretty cool. But if I had one of these, what would be the first thing I'd have to consider before I use it? Make sure it's calibrated, because it does you absolutely no good to calibrate somebody's $80,000 engine with uncalibrated gauges, right? And always remember that sometimes you're fighting squawks or discrepancies from a pilot based upon what their gauges are telling them when those gauges could be wrong. So you have to be very careful with what you're doing and uh, don't just change things. So I, at the same time, I'm thinking about, you know, somebody was asking me last week, but they came to me with, you know, a bunch of continental fuel injection problems. And I said, well, you, first thing you got to do is what? Somebody comes to you with a continental fuel, fuel flow system problem. Hey, the engine is, uh, what, throw out any, any discrepancy. You know, the CHTs are, are not right. The pilot says it's running too lean, too rich, too this, too that. What's the very first thing you should do with the continental system? No. Calibrate them. No. Just check the flow of the nozzles. Mm -hmm. um, that's an easy one to do, so uh, we can go with that. If it's one cylinder specific, you can do the, the nozzles. Uh, yeah, so we, we flow test. You got to set up the system. So Continental, and I don't have the verbiage in it uh, exactly, but I believe there is something to the effect of they state in a service bulletin the TCM fuel injection sh system should be calibrated or adjusted, I'll say adjusted, at every atmospheric condition change. So what do you take that to mean? The way for a standard aid. The standard, well, what is an atmospheric change? Winter to summer. Winter to summer. Mm -hmm. So you should have a summer setting and a winter setting. Mm -hmm. So, hey, that's their rules, not mine. This is, uh, you know, a lot to set up. Um, so at that, you're kind of, I draw from that, Continental says, hey, about twice a year you should set this system up. So somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've got this problem, my, my fuel, my system on my Continental. The very first question I'm going to say is, when was the last time it was set up? You had your, your fuel flows adjusted. And they say, fuel flows adjusted? And so you know right there that <coughs> they have no idea what you're talking about. We do that here. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to work that in, but I couldn't think of it. So, yes, I do that here. So, um, yes, so, in fact, that was, that was the whole thing. So they brought me, you know, all these, this list, and that was the first question. We set up the fuel flows. Do you mean, like, idle mixture, idle speed? I'm like, no, actual port of test calibrated gauges, tee it in, do the whole system setup. Yeah, we've never done that on an engine before. Well, if you're going to start troubleshooting Continental engines, you've got to start, you know. So they called me back the next day. Yeah, there's no record of this ever being done. What do you think could be wrong with it? <laughs> well, I think that the, everything is out of calibration, you know. Um, I think you need to start there. Set it up. See what you got going on. Okay, okay. Like two, three days later, you never believe what was wrong with it. What? It was totally out of calibration. Thing runs great now. You know. Actually, I just said, yeah, you're right. That needed to be done really bad. But nobody knows how to do it here. So I don't know what happened after that. So, um, but anyway, what I had uh, written down was actually how to do this. I, I have a video that does it, but it's so painful to watch because for, they do a minute and a half warning after every step. <laughs> and it's the same warning about, you know, caution, this is very dangerous, and don't put your head in the propeller, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I just, I can't even put it on canvas for you to watch. I'm like, oh, God, I couldn't. So, um, the shiny, spinny thing next to your yeah. So I will just tell you that um, port -a tests are pretty rare, very expensive. Uh, Continental, in their service uh, bulletins, um, and by the way, Continental's actually gotten away from service bulletins and I hate this, if you're listening, Continental. Um, i used to the service bolt in format, and they've really gone to something. It's called the uh, Master's uh, Maintenance Manual Book. Basically, they took all of 
the service bulletins and they shoved them in a maintenance manual. And so where you used to be able to say, oh, I just need service instruction M74-14 for the uh, putting in the nose seal. Now it's like, I don't, what page is it in? I and mean, the book is, you know, 200 pages. And you're like, ah, I got to find the index. Anyway, I'll get off that box. All right, so, uh, but in the service instructions, uh, it does tell you that all you really need is two calibrated gauges. So you tee in these gauges. And the interesting thing about this is if you actually look at the Continental System, you will actually find these T fittings built in. They're part of it. I and mean, they're just Continental thought about this. And so when they built the engine, they put in a T fitting. And so when you take out the gauge and this hose, what is left here? A cam cap. Blood. Better be a cap. Uh, at the last IA renewal, and even the one before that, a uh, guy from uh, NTSB gave a talk and probably one of the better talks I've ever heard. Not that he's some super dynamic speaker, but he just does such a great job of just matter of fact and just showing you the things. And uh, he's got a passion for what he does. If you ever get a chance to, to do, listen to this guy. Anyway, he showed an NTSB crash that he went to with a Continental system that had just had maintenance done. And pilot, the engine lost power, air, aircraft crashed. And I don't know the outcome of the, the people, but it didn't look good. And so he's looking around at the crash site and he shows the photos and you can see it, a little red plastic cap laying at the crash site. And he looks at the engine and what is it missing? The metal cap that went on here. And so he picked up the cap, screws is on, took a picture of it. That's what happened. So somebody used a plastic cap right here. Engine goes to full throttle. Pressure, pressure goes up, blows the plastic cap off. This is where all the fuel goes spraying out. Lucky, I mean, I don't know what happened, but fire would have been, no matter what, fire's worse. Um, so, you know, just people not paying attention. Plastic cap on that. No, that's, that's a lot of fuel pressure. So metal caps go on there, metal caps come back off. Uh, but you can see that you just have to tee in these two gauges. And so really what you're doing is you're matching um, your metered fuel pressure up here you're watching that as you're setting up your fuel pressures coming out of the pump, going into the fuel control unit, and then what comes out? Sarah? What is that guy's name again who watched the video? It's not a video. Uh, I don't think it is a video. His name is Justin. Justin something with the, at least local NTSB representative. Did you say you watched the video? No, it was at an IA renewal seminar. Oh. So it was an actual live kind of thing. That you <laughs> just listened to? Yes, it was a training class that I went to this year and then two years ago. Uh, sounds like break time. <laughs>